Hello, thanks for joining me here. I'm gonna take a minute to make sure everything's hooked up the way it should be, um, but can't thank you enough for joining me. As you see, right now it's just me, Nathan Cole. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, Gil, who is uh, incredibly generous in uh, joining us today, is gonna join a few minutes later. And so we'll get started and uh, make sure everything's working the way it should. Um, looks like we are good on YouTube. I'm going to make sure that we're good on Facebook as well. And um, I believe we are. Great. Excellent. Well, you know, unlike some other um, broadcasts I've done, I seem to be able to see both Facebook and YouTube comments. Um, there may be a lot of comments and a lot of questions, so I can't promise to get to all of them, but when you see me looking down here like that, that's what I'll be doing, and uh, already great to see uh, so many of you from all over. You know, I've uh, asked Gil to talk with us today, mostly because, what you know, why would I not want to spend time <laughs> talking to Gil Shaham? I mean, he's been one of my idols for uh, you know, almost as long as I've been playing the violin, and which is remarkable because he's <laughs> he's pretty young, and um, but I can just think of so many moments, uh, so many pieces, so many times listening to him play, and then later in life getting to meet him and spend a little time, um, all of which have made such an impact on me. I mean, thinking back. I remember his uh, romance album that he recorded with, um, I believe it was the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, all kinds of great slow violin short pieces, uh, so beautifully done. And, you know, shortly, unfortunately, it was before I joined the Chicago Symphony, um, he recorded the uh, Bartok's second violin concerto with that group. And um, I remember joining that orchestra, getting that CD, and thinking, like, I'm going to be part of this from now on. Um, luckily, I was in the Chicago Symphony when Gil uh, took the Brahms Violin Concerto with us on tour. And um, <laughs> at that time, uh, he told me, he may have used this line on other people, I'm guessing, but um, I asked him, I was amazed, I said, so how many times do you think you've played the Brahms Violin Concerto? And he said, I think I've played it roughly 200 times, smoothly, never. So I, I had to I always remember that. Um, and in addition, I wanted to bring him on here. Uh, it's very timely because he's, again, generously agreed to give us one of our challenge pieces for the upcoming Violympics. Um, if you've seen or heard anything from me over the last few weeks, it's been a lot of Violympics, and uh, if you're already registered to be part of that if you're already signed on. Awesome. I'm so looking forward to it. We're starting June 1st. Uh, it's going to be a full summer of organized practice. That, that doesn't make it sound as fun as it's going to be, but I provide the motivation for you to either get in shape, get back in shape, stay in shape over this, you know, very strange summer. And it's going to be six two-week events. And um, you know, each event's going to center on a few fundamental violin techniques in the first week, and then in the second week, I'm going to spring a challenge piece on you, a new piece that I'm hoping you haven't seen before, and using the techniques and strategies we've done um, in the last week, you're going to learn that piece in five days and record it. That's the challenge, but uh, the great thing is it's not just going to be me throwing that challenge at you. Um, Gil has picked a challenge piece, something that means something to him. And we're going to talk a little bit, I won't, we're not going to reveal what that piece is right now, but we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what goes into picking a challenge. And then I'm, I'm just curious how Gil learns new music. He's got a piece he's got to learn and perform. You know, maybe he's got time or maybe he's got to do it quickly. Um, so. Before uh, Gil joins us, please uh, type in some questions that you're interested in 
you know, in addition to the things I just mentioned, because uh, before he arrives, we'll have a little time here to, um, to organize a few questions. Uh, Carol, you, you saw him play the butterfly concerto. I assume that's that, uh, the butterfly lover's concerto um, with the Memphis Symphony. Yeah. I mean, we haven't even gotten to what I love about Gill's playing, but uh, you know, interesting thing, my wife Akiko was around uh, Juilliard, you know, she, she shared some teachers in common with, with Gill and, and the atmosphere at that time, you know, Juilliard, big, big, uh, famous Dorothy DeLay studio, and it could be pretty tense around there, if you can imagine the stage mothers, the stage fathers, everybody's kind of eyeing each other, you know, who's going to get what opportunity and what piece is that person on? And she said uh, she remembers when Gil got a, a, some big concert, you know, he may have been 13 or 14, and just how that seemed so right. Like, okay, <laughs> for once, somebody who just is an awesome player and a really nice person gets an opportunity, makes the most of it, and, you know, wouldn't it be great if it always worked that way? So ever since then, he's, he's been a star. Um, so we've got a question about, <laughs> from Shiree, how does he get the third movement of the barber so fast? Um, all right, we'll see if we can get to that. I love that recording of his. Um, most important musical principle. We'll see how we can wrap that in. Um, and yeah, Marie, uh, that's one of the big questions I have for him, um, how to approach first roaming through a new piece, a first quick sight reading or more in-depth dive. I'm secretly hoping, I don't know if he'll be able to um, specifically talk about the Violimbic theme, but I did shoot him over a copy. Um, not that he's, you know, gotten a chance to, to learn it or anything, but um, earlier today I sent it over to him in the hopes that he might take a quick look and say, well, here's how I would have approached learning it, because he knows that, that we all went through it. Um, so definitely I want to ask him that. Uh, ooh, we've got a lot of great questions already, and I hope we can... Um, ba -da -ba -da -da -da. Most excited about for the Violympics? For me, you know, it's, it's kind of the same as it was for the Violympic trials, where, you know, what I'm most interested in is... Um, let's see... This is Gil writing. We're going to get him on here, don't worry. We're having a good conversation without you. <laughs> um, I know, this is the problem with these these various platforms, but we'll get him on, we'll get him sorted. Um, I'm interested in seeing the progress that everybody's going to make in the games, really, because it's going to be a summer to go through all kinds of fun and fundamental techniques, and, and by learning those challenge pieces and recording them, um, you know, you'll be able to apply that to whatever you play from then on. All right, so let's see. We... Let me see what happens if I try to open that link. Well... Sorry for the delay. We're going to make it worth it when Gil comes on. And, uh, you know, if it's not going to behave on, on this broadcast, we'll switch over to another location and I can tell you where that is. But we will... Da, 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 da. Guys can join on the phone.
And let me see a few more of your questions here. Um, about practice regimen, yeah, that's, you've heard enough of, from me on that. Uh, we'll ask Gil and um, Robert, you ask, will the new piece be roughly the same length as the Violimpic theme? You know, what I'm asking um, from the different people that are picking these challenges, because you know it's not just uh, going to be Gil. We've got Simon Fisher, who has also selected one. And I don't think it's too preliminary to, to say that we're going to have James Ennis and Leela Josephowitz also picking pieces. And what I'm advising them is, yeah, to make it that similar length as the Biolympic theme, that two, three minute type length. And, you know, if we can do that, that makes it very doable in a week. Um, if they prefer a slightly longer piece, then I'll do what I did with the Biolympic theme, well, which I'm going to do this anyway, to provide modifications so that uh, people, different comfort levels, can learn these pieces, make them their own, and, and get the most out of it. Um, so Gil's writing back here, and we'll, we'll see what's going on. He was writing back. Uh, he's so nice to, to join us for this, and I hate for there to be any tech stuff in the way, but we will cope. Um, let's see. Now, Jacqueline, you talk about uh, not being able to keep up the pace uh, of the Violympics with the more experienced professionals, and <laughs> tips on not beating myself up during the 12 weeks. Um, well, you know, the first one is to, oh, I think there's someone here. Hello, Gil. Hey, Nate, good to see <laughs> Thank you, Thank you so man. much for being here. Yeah, nice to be here. Yeah, Gil Shah, I'm so generous for uh, joining us here, and I'm so sorry about uh, whatever was happening with joining. No, sorry, I'm slow with technology. Um, um, I guess well, there's, a, there's like a little forward slash and then a string of letters. Oh, okay. Yeah, my phone would have worked, but I'm uh, running out of juice. Oh, okay. Well, this now. you look great. You sound great. So <laughs> it's, it's all good. So who else we is have, here? Well, we've got, let's see, with us live, more than 200 people. Wow. And I'm going to guess that most, if not all, of, of these guys were part of the Violympic trials a couple weeks ago where, awesome. you know, they, their challenge was to learn the little piece um, that I wrote for all of us. And, you know, a lot of them took that challenge all the way and actually even rec made a video of that piece uh, at the end of five days and, and shared it in the community. Well, and Nathan, I loved the piece. Oh, you, you, you took I a look at it? I it now and I tried to read through it. Really? What a great piece. <laughs> Oh, no, it, I mean, it's pretty silly, but you know, the, that's one of the biggest questions that uh, everybody here has because they kind of grappled with the piece and they're madly curious as to how you would approach learning a new piece. Um, oh, wait, now first... I see people's comments. Oh, you can see. Great, great. Okay, okay. Now I see people. But is there any way to see people or? Uh, no, they're, they're not going to appear on, My guys. on the camera in this, but... No, they're they're super excited as as am I. I had just started telling them, just kind of you know I my sort of experiences listening to your playing from being a teenager and hearing um, you know your romance album with Orpheus and just when I joined the CSO, um, you had just I think recorded the bar talk with uh, was it Boulez Back. and um, so I didn't get to be a part of that, but. Um, and then you took the Brahms Concerto on tour with us, with the uh, David Zinman, yeah. I can't remember. Was it Elgar, maybe? Or oh, Dad, yeah, I'm so sorry. God. I think it might have, might have been Elgar. <laughs> You're absolutely right. I I heard you play Brahms a different time. <laughs> that was the Florida tour with David Zinman, the Elgar, yeah. So how long have you been now in L.A.? L.A. I've been here nine years. And, and you've been here, of course, several times just during that time. Um, so 
yeah. Anyway, it just I've I've been a big fan for so long, and uh, oh, hi, this is a treat. <laughs> um, well, maybe you know, and I've I've let them know that you've picked a challenge piece for for one of our Violympic events, and we're not going to say what that is. Um, but you know, you may talk a little bit about that. But why why don't we start with how you do like to learn a new piece, and you could talk specifically about the Violympic theme if if you like, or just what do you do in general? You know, you just um, messaged it over, and I was just, um, I had the violin out, so I tried to uh, play it through, and uh, and I really dig it, you know? I think that's the first requirement, right? Like, if you're not into the piece you're learning, it's much harder to learn it than um, if you really like it. And uh, actually, my question is more for you. How do you write a piece like that? You know, <laughs> I, you know I, I, I'm really not a composer. I, I tried to come up with, I thought of the different Olympic, uh, sorry, the different Olympic themes that there are. I uh, you know, there's like two or three big ones, and I, and I tried to sort of come up with something that sounded like that. And then um, I, I knew I wanted a modulation and I wanted like a couple variations and you know because it, it was a challenge I, I knew there were certain techniques I wanted in there I wanted some double stops and I wanted some sliding g-string stuff and you know a, a little fast stuff at the end so um, yeah no that, it was a uh, and a G major and then an E flat yeah. major and then yeah okay. yeah so is it it's like a march right it's like a little march. yeah yeah, so you you know we imagine all the different Violympians from the different countries kind of marching around the track if we could be together. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And how how who came up with the idea of Violympic? Well, yeah, I mean that that was that was me. I mean, I had wanted, you know, for for a while. I don't know how it is for you because you stay so busy year round. Uh, what your kind of practice routine is like in the summer compared to the rest of the year. Maybe it's the same, I don't know. But for, I think, a lot of us in orchestras or in school, um, or if we're teachers who kind of, kind of revolve around that school year, it's, the summer comes and it's either it's more dead and we kind of wonder what to work on, or it's busy with travel and, and you get out of your routine. And so people had asked me to put something together for the summer. Um, to kind of help organize and maybe get back in shape instead of feeling like they're languishing during the summer. And so I wanted something that would go along with the real Olympics back when that was still going to be a thing. And so that kind of gave me the, the name for it. Real Olympics got canceled, decided to still go on with this and, and try and make it fun. Um, yeah, how is it for you in the summer, generally, as far as keeping up your routine and yeah, you know, summer, so we, you know, we have a family of, we have three kids and we, we spend a month in Colorado. We go to Aspen every year and uh, we love hanging out there and we try to get outdoors as much as we can. So yeah, maybe, maybe less practicing than the rest of the year, but I also do kind of music festival hopping and uh, somehow that always ends up being um, a lot of different repertoire. So, yeah, I still find myself, you know, practicing, preparing. Do you feel like you you have to learn things more quickly in the summer, or do, are you one of those who really you work well in advance and you you know what you're going to be playing, chamber music wise, like months in advance? And you, I think I'm the worst person because it's so erratic, and there's no process. And, um, you know, I have to say these days, maybe a lot fewer days of uh, last minute cramming than, than before. Maybe in uh, my older age, I've learned to uh, prepare in advance or something like that. But, uh, I mean, when you find that you do, you're up against the wall a little bit, and you've got to learn something fast, do you... <sighs> Maybe let, let's say that it's a piece you've played before. Um, 
but now you're taking it back out and you've got to bring it back up fast. What are some of the first things that you do when you're, you're flipping through it? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, there's different things at different times. What would you say? What would you, how do you approach? You? you know, for me, it always used to be, I just flip through and whatever was the blackest page, you know, fastest notes, like that's, I would immediately key in on that. Um, you know, as I've gotten older, some of those kinds of things actually get easier. Like if I, I'm just a little bit better at seeing patterns. And so maybe the fast stuff is not always the hardest. Maybe, you know, now if I don't plan out some of the slides that I want or whatever, then I, then I get really disappointed in performance because I'm like, oh, I had this great opportunity and I, I just didn't take the time to prepare it, you know? Uh -huh. um, so it's, I think, yeah, it definitely depends on the piece, as you said, uh, I mean, what style it's in. You know, if it's, um, if it's something you have memorized, I find that's a very different thing than if it's something you, you need to look at the page, you know? So uh, maybe committing it to memory is a very helpful step. You know, suddenly once, once you have it memorized, it's a lot easier. I guess if I were to think of the piece you, you wrote that, I, that you just sent over, maybe the first thing to do is to decide what fingerings you want to use, what bowings, what slides, um, you know, just very practical, pragmatic things, you know. Do you tend to decide bowings, fingerings, slides? Do, do you tend to have those planned and set or do you like to improvise with those in performance Some, sometimes you have so many ideas that uh, it actually makes it worse right like when you have so many choices and then you're like ah oh, should i do this should i do that but yeah and then you're on stage you have to be decisive and i guess it's kind of fun when when it doesn't work too you know <laughs> it's kind of interesting um yeah you know I have to say my practicing has changed over the years. So like I learned from my um, oldest son, he started using this tuner. Like I wonder, do people on the group, do they use like, um, what is that, TM? I think the thing I, I have is called, uh, is it TM? Oh, no, no. Anyway, it's an app for tuning. Oh, uh, okay. You know? That's not the one with the smiley face, is it? That's like, the one. Uh, okay. Yeah. So like when you you hold a note that's in tune and the smiley face gets bigger and bigger. Or... Yeah, that's the one. And I, I do find that very useful. And also oh, very I... useful is the feature where they uh, hold down a note or they hold down a chord and you try to adjust to it. Yeah, is that something you had, you know, we've had tuners forever, we've had, you know, and the, they can do drones. Is that anything you did much of when you were younger? No, no. But I should have. I should have. And and the other thing was recording yourself. You know, I, I never used to record myself. I just thought it is painful, you know, it's like when you listen to your voice, you you never want to do that. You never want to listen to yourself. You never want to hear it. And, but it's actually so efficient. You know, you play something through, and you play it, and you hear so many things that maybe you would you wouldn't have heard if you kept going for another hour. You know, it really does save a lot of time. I mean, yeah. yeah. Now now there are fewer and fewer excuses uh, not to do that. I mean you. When I was growing up, you know, I had the tape recorder right there. It was super easy to do it, but it's like even just that step of rewinding and trying to find the place where the playback should start, you're like, that's oh, gonna be such a pain and I don't wanna do it anyway. You know, at least now you record it, the files right there, there's, there's really no excuse. So yeah, I've been trying to do more of that myself. So tell me more about Violympics. So what, what will happen now? Um, What's the next 
Yeah. Well, so it's starting up on June 1st, and um, you know, folks do still have a joint chance to, to join. I mean, I, I kind of had to set some arbitrary date um, so that I could have a little bit of time to prepare before June 1st, and that, that's actually today. Today is the last day that people can join. But um, then on June 1st, that's when event number one starts. And so like that morning, the first week's material will pop up in the on my website, and that'll be, you know, the collection of concepts that we're going to look at in that first week. I, th th in the first event, what we're going to be focusing on is um, physical setup, um, tone production, like with bow speed, pressure, and contact point, and then um, listening for pitch. Those are the the three, you know sort of indispensable things. And so I'm going to have daily assignments for everyone, um, you know, stuff that'll take no more than 20, 30 minutes, um, daily assignments to go through those concepts. And then second week comes, boom, Monday morning, there's the first challenge piece. And so people get the music on that day, um, and they'll have a video of me playing it because I, I have to learn whatever challenge pieces you know like the one you picked I've got to learn it and make my video yeah, and then yeah. <laughs> um, and and yeah then also my my strategies my suggestions for how to how to work on it how to learn it in five days um, with modifications if if necessary like I said because like in that Violympic theme not everybody here has really played double stops before. So I encouraged people to give it a try, but I didn't want the challenge to be, hey, you've got to do your first double stops and record this piece in five days. It's like, no, you know, give them a try, but let's decide by the fourth day kind of which version of the piece you're going to record. Um, some people hadn't done three octave arpeggios before, so do a two octave. Uh, Things like that. So I'm, I'm going to be doing that for all the challenge pieces too, so that um, everybody can participate and you know everybody's still got that deadline if they want to you know follow my suggested schedule. So that that really concentrates the work, but the difficulty of the piece can fluctuate depending on what people need. And then it's then it's off to the next event, some different concepts, and it goes like that for six events. Incredible. And this is the first time everybody's doing it, right? Yeah. Yeah, we went, we went through the, the quick version. We went through the Violympic trials um, a couple weeks ago. That was May 4 through 8. Or some people decided to do it a little bit later. They, they did their sort of five-day thing a little bit later. But um, yeah, this is the first time trying it. Um, yeah, again, it's just that idea that... So oh, great, I and mean, you guys are in the best hands possible with Nathan. Oh, no, I mean, that, that's way too kind. Um, I feel like I had these, and I, I want to be mindful of, of your time, too. Um, I know there were a couple great questions from the group. Well, one of them is, um, I saw Carol just mentions that you always project such joy when you're playing. Um, and that's obviously, you know, that comes through you physically, but then also just your playing itself. I mean, I think a lot of us struggle with, you know, we beat ourselves up. Uh, performing is maybe full of stress. Um, it's hard. Um, are you enjoying it as much as you seem? And how did, was that something you ever did struggle with? You know, I guess as long as we're here, we may as well enjoy it, right? <laughs> um, you know, I don't know how it is for you, but I remember Lauren Mazel, you know, the, the great maestro. I, I was very young. I was in my 20s and I was working with him. And then he, he said something to me, I think before we went on stage or maybe it was right after we finished and he said uh, you'll see Gil the older you get the more you enjoy music 
And uh, it's true, I have to say. Well, I find myself enjoying it more and more now. And and what a special thing to, to do together with, you know, with friends, with, with colleagues, with the people you admire, people you people you love, people you respect. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I do think there's, uh, you know, music can be so many things, but there's something very life affirming about, about music. And, uh, yeah, I, I do, I do enjoy, enjoy doing it. I think I finally <laughs> figured out how the, how the comments work here. I see some <laughs> people are saying, um, tonal energy. That's the one that I have. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there were a lot of votes for that, folks saying that that's the one they used too. I remember the, you know, the first time I saw that app, I, I just uh, I was playing a recording session with a, a colleague, you know, someone who's super on top of their game, and you know they they always play in tune. But it was the end of a long recording day, and by the end there were just a few places the engineer wanted to pick up, um, and you know this guy was pretty wiped and just put the app right there on the stand and during those last pickup takes all he was doing was playing into the app and <laughs> trying to get that smiley face yeah you just want the, the producer to be the smiley face right <laughs> yeah yeah what if you if you would maybe just talk a bit about recording um you know we were saying well in a casual sense, I've been doing more of that, you know, in my practice and all that. Most of the people here, if they did the trials or if they're doing the Violympics, they're going to have to record themselves. Nobody seems to like it very much. Is there any different kind of pressure for you when you've recorded? Um, or does it just feel like performing? Yeah, I, you know, we've done a couple of these things at home and I'm really not, um, not technologically uh, you know, adept at uh, at recording, and yeah, I guess we should all learn. Um, yeah, it's a little different from from playing. I often wonder if it's if recording would be better if you just took forever and just played many many performances and then pick the best piece. But but nowadays, you know. And actually, all my life, technology has been such that, that you know, really, whoever is producing the recording has to be a great artist, too. You know, they really have so much control. And there's so much that they can do with picking edits, with producing the sound, with mixing the sound, with getting the ambience, with it. Really. So recording is really a collaboration. And it's, um, I, I think, yeah, that, that's maybe the best thing I can say about it. It's like, it's like chamber music, but adding kind of a very uh, technical musician into it, you know? Somebody who well, so we shouldn't maybe be too hard on ourselves if we don't love a recording that we come up with where we're recording it and engineering it and everything ourselves. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, what, what they can do now is really kind of magic, you know. They, they can take a you know, violin and make it sound, uh, I don't know, like a double bass. <laughs> you you um, worked with Felix Gallimere uh, sure. before, right? He was one of my teachers at Curtis, and he, yeah, that... <laughs> I remember I was having a lesson once and there was a tuba in the room right next to us and it um I could hear it it was so loud coming through there and I everything seemed to annoy him so I was assuming that he was going to be really annoyed by this but he he stopped he went like and and he said oh it's a double bass I was like oh Mr. Galmier I think that's a tuba no it's a double bass, and what a fantastic tone! <laughs> and it was clearly like you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, I yeah, I I would love to sound like a double bass. I think, um, yeah. I, I'm not sure if this is my memory or my wife's memory, 
but we we loved him and he used to be at Juilliard and and um, th there was that time when we one of us passed by his studio and just stopped to listen he was in there by himself and he was kind of practicing you know yeah kind of fits personality yeah i i it took me way too long to figure him out if i ever did I, I felt like by the time my time with him was done i, I wanted to go back to the beginning because i understood him a little bit better um but you know meeting him i it's like knowing that he had worked with schoenberg and ravel and berg and all these people um it took me so long to figure out that what he really loved and he loved the, that music too but it was just like the, the virtuosic violin repertoire that's like what really did it for him and he loved hearing it played with style, and that's what I never quite understood about him until it was too late. I kept, you know, he'd yell at me because I didn't do this and I didn't do that, and I'd come back the next week thinking like, oh, if I just do all those things that he said, then he'll be happy. And I'd come back in and do all those things, and then he, oh, why, you know, because he got, I wasn't committed you know, I wasn't, it wasn't mine. I was trying to please someone else and he could pick up on that. Um, how do you, you know, when it comes to making every piece your own, is that something that, because you do, was, was that something that always came naturally to you? Or was there a time when you had to transition from things your teachers told you to doing your own thing? Yeah, that's that's really um, complicated question. You know, you have relationships with with uh, with each piece. You know, with each composer. With each, um, I, I guess I always say this. I, I think our job is very similar to the job of an actor. You know, we have to take what's on the page. The sort of ideal that's on the page and then we have to bring it to life for our audience we have to bring it to life for our, for our listeners so i think a, a big part of that is trying to understand what's on the page you know and studying the composers and putting it in context and yeah i'm then that seems for most people that's easier to do once you have a little age on you and you've maybe heard some more pieces by that composer and maybe witnessed a few things in life and watched a few movies and read a few books um, but some you know some people do seem in their playing to have that understanding very early you're certainly someone i think of in that way um, so I think you're very modest about that. Um, but yeah, what, what you say, of course, is true. It starts with what's there. and um, I mean, I don't know what, you know, with our life experience, like if you heard yourself playing 20 years ago, what would you think about that person playing? Would you, would you play the same? Would you play differently? I, I mean, I've been surprised both ways, but I, I think for me it's a little different. I, you know, when I was a teenager, I really was not a fully formed violinist. You know, I would not, had you put me out there to play in front of real audiences and in front of big orchestras, I just couldn't have, I didn't have all that stuff then. Um, you know, and I don't do it routinely now, soloing in front of big orchestras and making recordings and all that, but, but I have done it occasionally if I've been asked. So I guess w when I've heard myself playing from back then, sometimes I'm surprised, I'm like, well, actually, that sounds pretty good. Like, that doesn't necessarily sound like a 20-year-old or a teenager or whatever. And then other times I'm like, what, who, like, why did I think that was okay to play like that? <laughs> um, yeah, how, how is it for you? Do you listen to your old recordings? Yeah, I mean, I know that 
I, at least I feel like things are so much clearer in my head than they were 20 years ago. Um, but I guess I'm old enough to know that um, they're still not clear enough. Like 20 years from now, they'll probably, hopefully, things will be more clear. Well, I mean, you know, people record stuff multiple times. So, I mean, Glenn Gould had his famous Goldberg, and then he did another famous Goldberg, however many, 20, 30 years later or something. Um, I, I do love that, you know, Beethoven said, you know, I never go back to older pieces. Huh. I just write them and move on to the next one. And I think there's something beautiful. About that. Yeah, he moved fast. <laughs> And sometimes so fast, yeah. Like the violin concerto was so fast. Amazing. Well, Gil, I, I really I, uh, want to be mindful and uh, let you go. You've been so nice to, to join us here. And, you know, I'm sure we've only scratched the surface of possible questions for you, but. Um, yeah, I would have loved to meet everybody oh. here and, and speak with every one of you. And I, you know, violin world's not that big. I, hopefully, we will bump into each other. Um, well, certainly, you know, we uh, we all hope it's very soon. It'll be a different time, and people will be able to catch you where you're playing next. You know, I, I don't know if you knew. Um, I was actually going to be uh, concertmaster of your orchestra for the Brahms Concerto at Aspen this summer. Oh, no. I, I was, I've actually never been to Aspen, and that was going to be my first time, and it was going to be playing for your Brahms concerto, and I was so looking forward to it. <laughs> oh, me too. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, so that next time, and uh, yeah, is there any uh, anything at this moment that you're working on that you want people to check out? You know, just now when you said that, um, I thought Scott Wheeler, the composer, mm -hmm. wrote a, a little piece for me. I feel very honored, you know, and very lucky. He wrote a piece that he called Isolation Rag. It's for solo violin. Huh. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really, um, I think it's, it's very touching and, uh, and kind of subtle. And part of it, he quotes the Brahms Violin Concerto. And uh, oh. I don't know if this was his intention or not, but, you know, I always think of the Brahms Violin Concerto as a piece that has a lot to do with the concept of friendship. You know, he, Brahms's friendship with Joachim, but, you know, in particular, but in general, the concept of friendship, which was very important to Brahms, you know, a lifelong bachelor and... Uh, and uh, yeah, there, there's a very touching moment in this piece Scott wrote where he quotes the Brahms Violin Concerto and it's a little bit like, you know, the violinist isolated at home because of COVID and uh, longing to play the Brahms Violin Concerto. And at the same time, longing for, for friendship, longing to, to be out there with others. And so anyway, yeah, um, that. that came to mind when you, when you said that. Oh, no, that's beautiful. Is that uh, is that just for you right now, or is that is that a piece that anyone can find? Uh, I will ask. I will ask Scott if he's published it. I hope he does. You know, I think it's fun to play. Any other projects of yours that um, you want people to check? Is there any recording you've made recently, or um, anything you want to draw everyone's attention to to check out? Um, there are a bunch of things um, coming out. I guess I, I guess I, I should mention, mention them, but I, I don't want to uh, leave something out. I, a couple of projects coming out are the Brahms Violin Concerto and the Beethoven Violin Concerto with uh, Eric Jacobson and the Knights. Oh, uh, okay. And uh, the Corn Gold Violin Concerto with David Robertson and the St. Louis Symphony. Uh, perfect. The first Prokofiev Violin Concerto, Singapore Symphony and Lan Shui. The Alban Berg Violin Concerto with 
um, San Francisco Symphony and uh, Michael Gilson Thomas. These are all yet to come out, but the yeah, somehow, you know, wow. during this time we got a, we had a chance to do listening and maybe some post production work on all this and and also the five Mozart concertos and the uh, adagio. Just those with um, the SVR Orchestra in Stuttgart and the Maestro Nick McGeegan. Oh, okay. Some some projects. Coming out. Yeah. Just a few. So, so we should be able to learn a few, a few two or three minute pieces. I imagine. Yeah, if I hope everybody has a great time at Violin <laughs> I I'm jealous, and I want to monitor, and I want to check you out. So I'm going to ask you how I can follow along if possible. Oh yeah, you're, you're, you're in for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there maybe one place that everybody could hear about when these things come out? Do you have a, a an email? that goes out perhaps from your website or? Um, you know, I, 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 I'm i not personally involved. Yeah, but, sure. Uh, the lady who helps me out with this is really wonderful. Um, and she she does maintain a web page and a, um, I think Facebook and, tw and Twitter. But some, yeah, something like that. Yeah. We'll go for everybody here. Go there. Go to Gil's website. I'm sure it's not going to be hard to find. I think it's Gil <laughs> Schwamm. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, nice to be with you. Nice. I hope to meet everybody sometime. And great to see you, Nathan. Oh, great to see you. Thanks. I mean, uh, really, again, I, I can't thank you enough. For... Oh, for the peace. <laughs> bravo for the peace and bravo for the project. <laughs> and oh. love to your family. Thank you to yours, too. I hope, hope to see you again in person and uh yeah no. send me your address too don't forget <laughs> um i'm i'm gonna i'll stay on i'll say bye to you gil and I'll, I'll stay on in case there are um you know some some more questions about the program that'll be boring for you gil but thank you so yeah. much for for being here with us a special bye treat bye olympians <laughs> bye bye leave studio now okay bye <laughs> bye <laughs> Um, wow. Yeah, I know. Uh, I'm, I'm always amazed every time I, he was nice enough even, um, I don't know how many years ago, seven or eight years ago, um, I was kind of doing some fancy interviews at Disney Hall and I asked him if he'd participate and he, um, he said some amazing things in that interview, um, which would be worth me bringing back out and, and sharing. Um, I remember he talked for a time about the pressures of performing and in the end, you know, he, he said, look, it, for us, the stakes are, it's just not as high <laughs> as for a surgeon, for example. And I, I thought of that during this difficult time. And, um, you know, he said, if I play a note out of tune, nobody dies. And, um, you know, that, uh, of course, that's one funny way of saying it. It doesn't always feel so lighthearted when you're up there on stage uh, under pressure, I know. But I have a feeling that he's able to keep that perspective with him always. And, well, he, uh, you see how he is if you hadn't talked with him before. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stay here with you guys a little bit longer if there are any questions you, you have for me. And I'm... I'm certainly not offended if, if after Gil, <laughs> it seems rather mundane to, to ask any questions of me, but these could be about the Violympics um, or just about anything at all. Um, you know, for those of you here with me live, I will put the link in the comments for where you can see more details about that if you haven't already. Um, and let me see. Pietro, you ask, do you think that young violinists today are focusing too much on sound production instead of phrasing? Um, it, yeah, I know what you mean, uh, that they're... I have heard, certainly, a lot of young violinists in my lifetime uh, who I, I feel like overplay. You know, uh, a lot of the playing is 
very big. Um, the, the sound tends to focus. It's that concentrated sound near the bridge to project over an orchestra. Um, but you know, it's almost like every generation, there's a backlash against the last generation, right? And when I was growing up, the, the most famous and the most influential players, you know, especially in America where I grew up, would be like Itzhak Perlman, Pinkus Zuckerman, um, players with very big, very focused sounds. Now they were and, and are true artists who had an incredible variety in their sound, but a lot of people, and by the, you know, I, I wasn't immune to it, I would focus on that, the big aspects of their playing and try to imitate, you know, and I think a lot of us did that. And then it became popular to say, well, this kind of playing is, you know, it's, it's not real artistry, it's just big and loud. And so in recent years, I feel like I'm hearing all kinds of variety in young people's playing. Um, it's really all over the map, probably more variety than I heard 20 years ago when I was just starting my career. Um, so I think it's dangerous for anyone just to focus on big sound production, but it's worth knowing at least that the top players can in general play much louder <laughs> and can project much more easily than inexperienced players. I mean, they tend to have nice instruments that they take very good care of. Doesn't necessarily mean old, antique, expensive instruments, but solo quality instruments that are well taken care of, well adjusted, and they know how to project without extra effort, because they've got to do it all the time. You bet when Gil Shaham is in front of the orchestra, everybody in the hall can hear him, but he's not, you know, scrubbing away either. Um, now, Elaine, you ask if the Violympics is for professional young musicians as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was a professional young musician once, sadly. And, you know, these are the things that, some of which I did back then, that have been very successful for me. Some that I wish I knew back then. Ways to organize practice, ways to get around the instrument, to listen, practice techniques, learn music quickly. So, yes, very much so. Um, the surprise piece, I can't tell you. Can't tell you his or anybody else's. Um, and then, uh, Tara, you ask, uh, you all seem to miss the live sessions. Will they be staying on YouTube or on the website with Violympics? So, First of all, the Violympic trials that we did a couple weeks ago, um, those are on YouTube right now still. Um, I'm going to leave them on YouTube um, for the time being. I don't know exactly how long they'll stay, um, but I'm going to leave them up for now because I, I want people to be able to take that challenge, learn the Violympic theme in five days if they want. Um, the Violympics themselves, I'm designing so that they do not have to be on a set schedule because we've got people from all over the world. We've already got a couple hundred folks. They're from all over. A lot of you guys, you're from all over. And there's no one time that's going to work for everybody for the live sessions. So there's hardly going to be anything live in the Violympics. Each week, the new material is going to come out. It'll be the musical examples that we're using, the daily assignments, and then my video or videos to take you through those assignments. The second week of each event, new material comes out. That's the challenge piece. My video playing the challenge piece, another video taking you through how I might prepare it. Um, and so all of that, you get that at the beginning of each week and you can view it whenever and you keep also you keep access to that forever. Um, so even after the 12 weeks, I, I have people who are participating, they've already told me I'm not going to do any of this during the summer. My summer is I I got to remodel my house. I got to do this, that, or the other, um, and so I'm going to do the whole thing after the summer. Um, now they had to register now because I still have to prepare everything for them in case they change their minds. But that's what their plan is, and that's perfectly fine too. 
um, those people won't, you know, score points toward winning the medals if, if that's something that <laughs> helps motivate you. But, um, but they're going to be able to participate just the same. And I will appear, kind of like I'm doing now, I'm going to appear live once every event, once every two-week event to do what we're doing now, but I'll have my violin too. Um, and, you know, take questions, offer tips on that event's material. But that, that'll be available for replay as well. Um, oh, and this, the session, Tara, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is on YouTube. <laughs> and it'll, it'll stay there. Um, and then, Hallie, you ask, uh, will there be a daily video to help you organize? Um, I haven't decided... For each event may be a little bit different. You will have daily assignments for sure, just as you had in the Violympic trials. So you you know you had a PDF of your journal, and that you could use to organize your thoughts and write things down. You had a PDF of the piece, the challenge piece, and then you had a PDF uh, called strategies and assignments. So in there, I gave you an assignment for every one of the five days. And, you know, for the trials, we had five live sessions. Uh, so that I'm not going to do in the Violympics because there's, there's no one time that's going to work for everybody. So I won't necessarily have five videos per week. It may be one longer one. It's not going to be a two and a half hour long video because nobody wants to <laughs> watch that much video. You never have any time to play. But it might be one long, longer video walking you through all of the assignments for the week, or it may be a series of shorter ones. That could depend on the event. But you get all of that at the beginning of the week. But you will have daily assignments to help you organize for sure. Um, Romeo or Romeo, I, I copied that link one more time in the comments, because um, that's how you sign up. And let me see. Uh, Charlene, you ask about the style of lifting and dropping left hand fingers. A bent finger at the first knuckle, and if by the first knuckle you mean this base knuckle that's closest, yeah, this one, <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> that's the way to do it. Um, in other words, you want your finger to have the same shape, lifting and dropping at all times. And so I'm not lifting and dropping it from any of these knuckles. It's always that base knuckle. So the finger can always be there for pointed back at the string. It's the shortest path back to where it needs to go, keeps everything nice and organized. And when you can keep your hands still and move every one of the four fingers either together in patterns or independently, that's when you can play fast, easy, in tune, consistent. Um, and we're going to be hitting that uh, right near the beginning of the Violympics. Um, the first event, physical setup, we're going to look right at that, as well as overall posture, how the bow arm lies, um, tone production and intonation. But event two, we get even more into hand frame, that idea that if you always know where your one and four are, you know, that octave or that perfect fourth, and if you're always able to maintain a nice shape in the frame, no matter what the different fingers are doing, then you can know where all the notes are, and you can play um, anything in, in tune and consistently. Um, now, Charlene, you, you say the top knuckle near the pad. Uh, from my understanding of what uh, Kurt Sossman's house teaches, uh, th that's not my understanding of what he teaches, and it's not the way I learned. In violin playing, I, I want that last knuckle, well, I, I call it the last one, but whatever, whether we want to call it last or first, the one nearest to the fingertip. Now, I want that to be flexible for vibrato, um, but if I'm talking about lifting and dropping fingers, I don't want that one to be involved. So, um, let me see if there are any more questions from you guys. Oh, and Jacqueline, you, you ask, are there instruction videos in the weekly materials? Uh, absolutely. Yes. And you know, it will, again, it's not going to be necessarily one per day, but you will have an assignment for every day, and my video or videos 
will take you through each of those assignments. So yes, you'll have my, my help. <laughs> um, and Hallie, you, you ask, uh, you let, let me, because I just got one of yours, Hallie, let me take another one and I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, Solomon asks about fourth finger vibrato. Uh, ideally, it works just like the other fingers vibrato. So I think, you know, to have a nice fourth finger vibrato, the prerequisite is that your fourth finger behaves like the other fingers, right? So if one, two, and three move like this, and then four moves like that and sticks straight up, that's a pretty good sign that the four is not quite as strong or as flexible as the others. And it's probably going to be hard then to have it vibrate in the same way. So first you want to work on the shape of the four, how it lifts and drops. And then the vibrato, I have a video on YouTube, a flexible effortless violin vibrato that gets into the vibrato motions themselves. Um, and let me get yours, Hallie, before I lose it. Improving bow changes at the frog. Um, the basic idea is that you want the sound at the end of one bow to be the same as the sound at the beginning of the next bow. So rather than focusing on the bow change, focus on the sound at the end of the up bow and the beginning of the down bow. That sounds easy to say. I do also have a video on that. It's called um, Soft Starts and Smooth Bow Changes at the Frog. So that's something you can look at too to, for specific exercises. Uh, Rebecca, you asked about feedback on the recordings of the challenge pieces. And I will not be able to do that in the Violympics because there's just no way I could do it for everyone. Um, I'm going to be, you know, for those of you who like Facebook or tolerate Facebook, um, maybe you're on Facebook right now, you know, we're going to have the Violympic Village. That's our Facebook group, our community. People are going to be in there sharing, posting, you know, perhaps sharing the videos that they make of the challenge pieces, although that's not required. Um, and so the group will be able to offer feedback to each other. And I'll be in that Facebook group several times a week, checking in, offering encouragement, answering questions when I can. Sometimes, you know, I may want to highlight a video and, and offer some comments and feedback. But in general, that won't be part of the Violympics. I just couldn't do it for everybody. Um, let's see. Pietra asks, the best way to improve the number of pieces in our repertoire? Um, you know, I guess two ways. One is to learn how to learn how to learn pieces more quickly, right? So that you can move from one to the next. Um, and the other is to practice more hours um, because then you can play more things at once. You know, I, I never like to just work on one thing at a time. I always want to have at least two contrasting pieces so that if I get really frustrated by one, I can just switch to something else. Um, and, you know, usually practicing more, that's the first thing people think of. But there's a limit to that, right? I mean, we all have different lives. And even the top soloist, we didn't ask Gil exactly how much he practices in a day. But you heard him say, summertime, he wants to be outdoors with his family. And so he's going to limit his number of hours. And therefore, he's got to look for ways to, to get through things more quickly. So I think those are the two, two ways that go together. Um, Uh, Gloria, you ask, when I talk about position changes or shifting, will I also talk about extensions or reaching? And absolutely. Because uh, one of the ways that people's intonation can suffer is if you start confusing those two things. Um, if you get out of that nice frame. And what I mean by that is, here's a good way to go about things. You're in one position you move to another position. That's a shift, right? But the hand is nice and still. I'm not shifting while at the same time doing all this weird stuff. Um, now, if I want to extend, I can reach back with the one. I can reach up with a four if I need. I can reach up with a four and a three. But I want the back of the hand here to stay just as it is. I want the hand to be still so that I keep my nice frame. Sometimes you want to shift and then reach. Other times it might be a reach and then the hand catches up. But you, you keep those things separate so that you know what you're doing and you're not just crawling around the instrument. That's when things get dicey, inconsistent.
Um, the grand opening of the Violympic Village will be on the first day of the Games, so June 1st. That's an easy one to answer. Um, great. My take on memorization from Tetsuo. Um, you know, you heard Gil say that he, um, and that, that's not something I'd talked with him about before, but you heard Gil talk about how he feels like it's easier to shape a piece or to, to make musical decisions when you have it memorized. Um, and I think he's got a great point there. It's easier when you are not distracted by the visual. You, and any of you, I know you've experienced this, when you close your eyes, you get a lot more aware of what you hear, what you smell, what, you know, physical sensations. That's because it takes a lot of brain power to <laughs> process visuals, and it can be distracting. Um, so in the same way, I can see how you get a piece of music memorized, you can just focus on how it sounds, how it feels. Sometimes then decisions can come more easily, more clearly about how you want to shape things. Um, but that means you need to start memorizing a little bit earlier in the process, right? If you're just memorizing at the very end for performance, then probably you've made most of your decisions about how you're going to shape it. So um, memorizing things for me was very easy when I was younger. I think that's true for a lot of people. Uh, now I have to work a little bit more at it. I have to do concentrated memory work. It's just part of getting older, I think. Um, but that is why I do it, so that I can focus on the sound, the feel, when I'm familiar enough with it. Um, oh, Nikki, hi. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, what you will gain by taking part in the Violympics, well, Nikki's already very accomplished, and I still hope to, still hope to challenge Nikki. But um, I think what everyone can take away is, you know, not just a way to be organized for the summer, which is, you know, that's how this starts, right? It's a way to organize your next 12 weeks of practice. But then, of course, you can apply that to anything you learn later, and you can think back to well, you know, I really changed the way my fingers fall on the string in a week or two weeks. And that made it easier to play the musical examples in event number two. And it made it possible for me to learn the challenge piece for event number two. And I have the video to prove it. So let me look back at that and see what I was doing. Um, and then, yes, you ask if it's things that you can access forever and use forever. Yeah, anybody who's part of the games keeps access to that forever. So that's a great question. Um, oh, now I'm sure you're, I'm not going to say your name correctly, but um, Svante, Svante? Um, if I think in positions or in intervals while shifting, or just the sound of the note, um, or is it more muscle memory? And that's something that's changed for me over the years. I used to rely only on I thought that the only proper way to, you know, get around the instrument and to, to play in tune was by muscle memory. I thought, well, it would be kind of cheating or amusical, non-musical, to think about, oh, I'm going to shift a perfect fourth or a perfect fifth. Um, I thought, I have to be better than that. I have to just be able to pick it out of the air to feel it. Uh, now I know that I want both. Yes, I want to know how it feels and to repeat it a number of times. But I also want to know what the interval is. And I use a lot of guide fingers when I shift. That's something we're going to go over in the event where we get into shifting. I believe that's number three, uh, the third event. Uh, if you check the page I linked to, it lays out what the different events are going to focus on. But guide fingers. I think a lot of us think that we need to graduate from guide fingers. You know, that concept of da -yum -bum, shifting on one finger and then dropping another one. We need to get past that. We need to be better than that. I use them all the time. Um, doesn't mean that I always want my listeners to hear the guide note, but I'm always shifting with some kind of guide in mind. Um, 
that's because I know what interval I'm shifting um, and how far my hand is going. Because let's say I have an octave shift from one to four on the same string. The notes are an octave apart, but my hand is moving a fifth. And that's crucial to know that. Otherwise, I might look at it and think, oh, it's an octave, it's a huge shift. It's only a shift of a fifth. Uh, and you can apply that to, to any shift. Great. I, as we go on, I, the questions are getting more and better. <laughs> but um, I fear that I may not be able to get to all of them. Uh, oh, the question of a shoulder rest. Um, that's a good one. <laughs> so I don't use a shoulder rest. Um, and that's a change that I made only about six years ago. Um, it was a long process for me. And, you know, I'll just say right up front, I don't think that one way is better than the other way. I think that one way is better for me, and that's why I do it. <laughs> but um, I never make recommendations to people like you should or you shouldn't. Um, for me, I, I tell you exactly how it started. Uh, I was unhappy with uh, my expressive shifting. I felt like I could get around the instrument, but that it sounded rather practical. I didn't feel I had the, the expression, the variety of slides uh, that I would hear in the players that I most admired. Um, so I actually asked, you know, I, I asked my wife, Akiko, about it. She's assistant concertmaster here in L.A., so fantastic violinist, and, you know, why not get the help right under my own roof? And she was noticing, you know, you, you really drop support when you're shifting. You know, it's like your hand is just kind of apart from the violin, and you're just trying to get to the next note rather than supporting and having the hand be part of the violin. So as I worked through scales and arpeggios, keeping that in mind, I felt, yeah, this is... At first I thought, well, what a pain to try to hold up the instrument while playing at the same time, but then I really got into it, and I felt like, yeah, I feel more secure, like my hand is a part of the instrument, and... You know, it's not a problem to support during shifting. And as I did that, I realized, you know, I find I'm, I'm using my head less. I don't need to brace it on the shoulder rest as much as I used to. I still had the shoulder rest on. But I, there came a point where I realized, I think this shoulder rest is just kind of sitting here, not necessarily helping. Let me take it off. And even though I had tried that in the past, I had not built the support from the left hand. And so it had never worked before to take it off. This time, when I took it off, I realized, huh, I'm kind of moving the same, whether it's on or off. It's just more comfortable with it off. I can feel the vibration of the instrument, you know, into my collarbone a little better this way. It's, it's lighter. You know, there's not the rest on it. And I liked the sound of my vibrato better. Felt like the, the way the fingers... Uh, contacted the strings. It was just a friendlier angle. Um, so I've never gone back. So that's why. Um, I think it's worth everybody learning how to support with the hand, whether you're going to do it all the time, as you have to do if you're not using a shoulder rest, or whether it's just something that you can call on when you feel like you need it. Um, there was a question I know about what do you do when you get tired of a piece. Um, if I can, I stop playing it. Um, but sometimes, like, if it's... Because there have been questions about auditions, too. Um, if it's an audition piece, something that I'm prepping as part of a list, I don't have the choice of not playing it. But I will take a break from it, even for a day or two. Um, and that's something that I... You know, my kind of audition timeline. I always build in time to work on a batch of music and then let it rest for a little bit, then bring it back and let it rest, and then bring it back. It's kind of like if you're making bread during this quarantine. <laughs> You've got the different rises. I, I like to do that with the music. I don't want to start practicing it three months before and then practice it more and more and more and more until the day of the audition. That's just crazy. Um, so when I can, I take a break from the piece. If I can't, then I insist on practicing it or listening to it in a new way. And 
maybe I'll just change a bunch of fingerings and bowings, and sometimes that sparks some new ideas. Maybe I'll listen to a recording of it that I have not listened to before, get a different perspective on it. Um, I'll often play it without vibrato, so that I'm hearing exactly what my bow hand is doing. And often then I get, often that's a negative surprise. I'll take away the vibrato and I'll realize I'm not doing anything with the bow. I'm not shaping. You know, no wonder it felt boring. No wonder it felt unmusical. Let me now put in the shape that must be there from the bow. Ah, and then when I put the vibrato back, now it feels alive. Now I like the piece better. That's what often happens. Um, great. Continuous vibrato. So that's just the idea, right, that your vibrato keeps going from finger to finger, note to note. Um, people use a more continuous vibrato now in general than they did a hundred years ago. Um, by the time the first real superstars of recording uh, came out, I'm talking about, you know, Fritz Kreisler, um, and of course, soon after that, Heifetz. Uh, by the time they came on the scene and we have their recordings, continuous vibrato was more the style. But just before them, uh, people didn't really do that. They would vibrate on notes that they felt were important and then leave other notes without. So now, we I mean, the general style now is continuous vibrato, but that doesn't mean it should always be the same. You know, just because something continues doesn't mean it continues exactly in the same way. So um, what I always encourage is focusing on those notes that are most important, giving those the most vibrato, of course, or the most intense vibrato. Could be the fastest, narrowest, could be widest, depending on the context. And then basing everything else off of that. Um, what I don't want to hear, or what I don't want to notice in myself, is a bunch of vibrated notes and then one in the middle that's dead and then a bunch of other vibrated notes. And that's something that if you listen critically to yourself, you might hear. You might realize, huh, I always vibrate a second finger, um, but if there's a one right before it or right after it, that's always dead. It's so important to be able to pick up on patterns like that. Um, there might be a passage where you choose to do that, but you don't want to let it happen without you knowing it. Great. <laughs> um, I think I will close with, with this question, uh, Romeo, because it's, it's a great one. Um, because you, you guys have so many great questions. Um, so we could stay here all day, but I, I do want to let you enjoy the rest of your day, too. Romeo, you ask, what level is the Violympics best suited for? And, you know, I'll try to... I'll try to give a, a, a practical answer that, you know, that everybody can relate to. Um, because I don't want to say it's appropriate for every single level. I, I think that, you know, you would, well, I've had people telling, telling me I'm, in, I'm studying Suzuki Book 5, Suzuki Book 6, but that's it. Can I do the Biolympics? And to them I say absolutely because if you look at Suzuki books five and six, you have double stops, you know, you're shifting, you're maybe starting to play off the string, you're playing fast passages, uh, you're vibrating by that point. I mean, you're doing almost every one of the techniques already that we're gonna be looking at in the Violympics. Um, now that doesn't necessarily mean that you will find the challenge pieces easy um, and in fact, you may want to take some of the modifications that I suggest, um, or in some cases play things not at full tempo. Uh, and I would rather have you do that than to take on a challenge that is just going to frustrate you. You know, I want every one of the challenges to be a little bit of a reach, because that's what's going to help you grow. Um, but I don't want it to be something at which you can't succeed. So I, I feel like that level you know, Suzuki book five, six, if, if that means something to, to you guys, um, is totally appropriate for the Violympics. If 
everything is going to be new to you. You know, if you've never tried playing with vibrato, if you're barely shifting, you know, shifting positions, uh, you have never looked at different bow strokes, um, never played double stops, never felt like you could play anything fast. You know, that's a lot than to take on all at once. Um, I still think you could certainly get a lot out of seeing the material the way I present it, um, taking a look at practice techniques that I have, but you wouldn't get then as full an experience as those people who are already familiar with some of that. Um, so I hope that helps answer. I, I, I don't think it's possible to get someone set up from zero on the violin online. Not yet. Not yet. I, I love working online. Um, and in some cases, I, believe me, uh, it's hard to believe, but um, in some cases I do think it's better than in person because of the ability to do things on your own time, to repeat, uh, to watch things over and over, um, to not always have to play live when you feel all that pressure. Um, but getting someone set up from the beginning, that I haven't found a great way to do online yet. So. Um, but aside from that, all the way up to those of you taking auditions, learning the hardest concertos, I mean, what I'm laying out here is uh, they're the practice methods um, and the ways to do the techniques that I use myself, um, you know, as recently as, <laughs> you know, this week, uh, just trying to learn these challenge pieces and all of that. So I, I will leave you with that. Um, I will paste one more time the link uh, to the info page on the Violympics. Today is the last day um, to register, to join in. So, you know, to those of you who already are, that's awesome. I can't wait to start working with you June 1st. Um, and if you're thinking about it, take a look at this, uh, the link that I just sent. Still questions, email me contact at natesviolin.com. Um, I'll, I'll be here to look at your questions on email. Uh, there's a lot of great info on that page, believe me, it's a long page. Um, so hopefully you'll see what you're looking for there. But um, yeah, I'm just, I'm thrilled that this worked out with Gil today. They really made today special. And um, yeah, he's, he's got his challenge all, all set for you. Um, and for me too, I gotta take the challenge as well. Um, and many more, like I said, Leela Josephowitz, James Ennis, uh, Simon Fisher, uh, whose books you may know and love as I do. We've got tone right here. Well, there's some glare on that tone. Warming up, <laughs> both of which I use on a nearly a daily basis. So he's also picked out a challenge for you guys. Thanks so much for being here with me and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. And if you're thinking about those Violympics, today is the day. <laughs> All right, I'll see you really soon. Bye.